at around 11.20 p.m. on October 12, 1978, a police dispatcher for the Englewood Sheriff's Substation, located just outside of Port Charlotte, Florida, passed by a quiet, desolate spot in an uninhabited part of town. This individual noticed a brush fire beginning to burn out of control in a vacant field near Tigard Street. They called in the fire to the sheriff's office, who in turn contacted a local fire station. Firefighters would arrive at the scene approximately 25 minutes later, noticing that most of the flames had already started to burn out. They were able to quell what embers remained quite easily, but made a grisly discovery in the early morning hours of Friday the 13th. When one firefighter went to poke what appeared to be a smoking log, he discovered that it was actually the charred body of a young girl, who authorities would later determine had been alive when the fire was started. This is the story of Linda Pickeritz. Linda Carol Pickeritz was the fourth and youngest child born to her parents, Paul and Betty Pickeritz, who worked as a carpenter and a waitress, respectively. Rounding out the rest of her immediate family were one older sister, Deborah, as well as two older brothers, Paul and Joseph, who everyone called Joey. Linda and her siblings grew up in New York, but the family moved down to Florida in July of 1978, when Linda was approximately 12 years old. They had moved down the East Coast because her parents' work schedules had been consuming the better part of their week with her father, Paul, working as a stagehand for CBS television seven days a week and 18 plus hours a day. They all wanted to move somewhere quieter, perhaps more scenic, where they could spend more time with their family. As a result, her parents, Paul and Betty, had to change their careers, but that was a small price to pay for their overall happiness. The family settled into Port Charlotte, Florida, which wasn't nearly as popular back in the late 1970s as it is now. At the time, Port Charlotte was a moderately small town about 100 miles south of Tampa and approximately 30 miles northwest of Fort Myers. There, they rented a home in the 900 block of Ab Henry Circle, which was located near the various creeks and waterways that cut through this suburban community, which was not only much more scenic than the family's previous life in New York, but much quieter and more relaxed. Despite moving to this region during the summer of 1978, the family quickly became accustomed to calling the region home and settled into an easy routine. Linda started taking classes at a local high school, and one of her teachers, Sherry Reagan, who had only known her for a short time, later recalled, She was perky and always had a smile whenever she passed me. Gym teacher Sally Baldwin later stated, Linda was a tough little girl, one of the best basketball players I've seen. She was a tough little cookie. During roll call, she always said her last name over and over for me so I would pronounce it correctly. In October of 1978, just months after moving to Florida, Linda's parents were called back to New York for the most unfortunate of reasons. Her paternal grandmother that lived on Long Island had suffered a cerebral hemorrhage, and Linda's mother and father would fly up to visit on short notice. So Linda was put into the care of her older sister, Deborah, who agreed to watch over the children while their parents were gone. Other than the absence of her parents, October 12th unfolded just like every other Thursday. That day, Linda went to class at Port Charlotte Junior High School, attended English, during which she promised her teacher she would get a 100% on a spelling test the next day, social studies, math, lunch, gym, science, and then home ec. After school, she returned home and then rode around on her prized 10-speed bicycle throughout the neighborhood. For a bit, she was joined by a young girl that lived next door, 8-year-old Vonnie Nave. At around 6.30 p.m., Linda planned to ride her bike about a mile away to a convenience store. Eight-year-old Vani asked her mother if she could go along, but was told no, especially not on a school night. So Linda went by herself on a trip that she had become quite accustomed to, the Lil General Store, which was located near the intersection of Midway Boulevard and U.S. Route 41. 
had been a regular destination for Linda throughout 1978. Almost every night, at around the same time, Linda rode her bike the one mile to the general store to pick up some candy or a pack of chewing gum. She was not allowed to bike down Midway Boulevard, a popular throughway, but would instead have to take a less direct route through quieter neighborhoods. However, after leaving her family's neighborhood at around 6.30 p.m., several hours would pass without Linda returning home. Her siblings readied dinner that evening, but Linda was a no-show entirely. Attempts to rouse her throughout the neighborhood would prove unsuccessful. Linda's older sister, Deborah, began calling around to Linda's friends and family acquaintances in the hopes of tracking her down. After that proved fruitless, she began going door to door with their brothers, asking if anyone had seen Linda, but no one had seen her for quite some time. As minutes began to turn into hours, Deborah was finally forced to call the sheriff's office at around 10.30 p.m., and a missing persons report was officially filed at 11.22 p.m. Sadly, though, the reporting of this coincided with the discovery of a charred body in a nearby field along Tigard Street and Toledo Blade Boulevard. This was about four miles away, near the region of town known as Murdoch, in an area that was mostly unpopulated at the time. Firefighters responded to the call of a brush fire at around 11.47 p.m. and discovered the body of Linda Pickeritz minutes later. It was unknown whether her body had first been set on fire or if she had been consumed by a fire started in the field around her, but the intended effect was unmistakable. Linda had been found, but the circumstances of this discovery would horrify not only her loved ones, who were unprepared to deal with such a tragedy, but the entire community. Everyone who learned about the case in the coming days was shocked to hear how the body of this bright-eyed, perpetually smiling 12-year-old had been burned in a desolate field just outside of town. Charlotte County Sheriff Alan LeBeau would later speak to the press about the details of this crime, describing the person responsible for it as a sick weirdo. In his words, it was a brutal, brutal murder. In my 10 years in law enforcement, never have I seen a slaying of this type, nor has anyone on my staff. This was a brutal slaying done by a very sick individual. Unfortunately, forensic evidence was hard to come by at the crime scene, which had been set on fire and then promptly extinguished. Charlotte County Sheriff's Lieutenant Jim Jones would recall a year later, the fire destroyed much of it. The scene was sprayed down with water before we got to it. However, in the field surrounding the body, police were able to find drag marks, indicating the general direction that the killer had dragged Linda's body. After arriving at the spot where her body was found, police believed that this killer had then covered Linda's body with gasoline or turpentine, or some other flammable substance, and then set her on fire. Even though Linda's body had been found nude, authorities found evidence that pieces of her clothing had been the kindling for the fire. Based on zipper and button marks on her torso, it was believed that her clothing had been placed on top of her body, and that was likely how the fire started. Other pieces of clothing Clothing were discovered near the body, as was a fingerprint sample, which would be unsuccessfully compared to at least 15 suspects in the months to come. Approximately 12 hours after Linda's burning body was found, police discovered her abandoned 10-speed bicycle near the corners of Broad Ranch Drive and Midway Boulevard, about two miles away, near the convenience store she had visited that evening. It was hidden in the bushes, and had likely been put there by the killer. Police gathered statements from multiple witnesses, which indicated that Linda had made it to the little general store she visited almost every night. This implied that she had been abducted on her way home, perhaps along Midway Boulevard, which she wasn't supposed to travel down, but may have done so anyway because her parents were out of town. Investigators believed that Linda had been abducted right after a friend spotted her leaving the store at about 7.15 p.m., since her bike was found incredibly close to this location. Unfortunately, there were very few witnesses in the area at the time, and very few were able to recall anything overly suspicious. 
Police conducted a door-to-door -door canvas of the area leading to and from the general store, and were unable to find anyone that had seen or heard anything. Speaking specifically about this, Sheriff Alan LeBeau told the press, No one saw anything or heard anything. So far, we don't have much to go on. Based on statements provided by Linda's family, it was implied that the 12-year-old would not have trusted a stranger or gotten into their vehicle willingly. Her family had taught her not to trust anybody she did not know, and she had learned about a relative's first-hand experience of being abducted approximately 10 years prior, a relative that was thankfully unharmed. But that experience informed the family's urgency when teaching Linda not to trust strangers, and they believed that she wouldn't have just abandoned her prized bicycle regardless. This led investigators to theorize that Linda had not gone along willingly with her killer, and was perhaps forced or coerced into their vehicle, and then driven away to the location where she was later killed. The autopsy of Linda's body was performed by Dr. Peter Tan, the medical examiner for Charlotte County, who ruled her cause of death as a homicide by way of burning. He found that 12-year-old Linda had not been killed before being set on fire. Rather, she had been set on fire while still alive, and black soot in her lungs indicated that she had been breathing in smoke before eventually dying as a result of that and the burns all over her body. Later, referring to the samples of singed clothing on top of her nude body, Dr. Tan would testify, if she was conscious, she would have most likely have tried to escape, and we would not see the clothing on her chest. Unfortunately, the body of Linda Pickeritz was so badly burned that Dr. Peter Tan had a hard time determining certain factors, such as whether or not Linda had been beaten or sexually assaulted before her death. He found no evidence of sexual assault, nor of any internal injuries or brain damage but stated that the fire had destroyed any possibility of him ruling definitively on any of those. Later, he admitted, because of the damage, the burn effect, from the examination there is no proof, but it cannot be ruled out. Dr. Tan would discover that one of Linda's arms had been broken, but believed that this could have been caused by the fire that consumed her body. It was impossible to tell otherwise. Tests that were performed later on would determine that Linda had not consumed any drugs or alcohol before her death. This indicated that she had not been drugged or poisoned by her killer before being killed, as had been theorized early on, as investigators struggled to figure out how she had been burned to death without fighting back or drawing any kind of attention to herself. Later, when speaking to the press, Punta Gorda Police Chief Donald R. Bennett would state, In terms of brutality, I can't think of anything quite like this. Early on, police officials stated that they had received reports that at least three children had been approached by a suspicious man that Thursday, who reportedly tried to pick them up in his car and lead them away to another location. All of these incidents, which had been reported to the children's parents and then police, had taken place near Meadow Park Elementary School along US Route 41. Unfortunately, all of the children involved were incredibly young, so police were unable to draw many details out of them for a description of this potential suspect. A woman would later present police with a sketch of a man that she had seen in the area, but the sketch was so generic that investigators had a hard time matching it up with any of their potential suspects. Anonymous sources would later claim to the local newspaper, The News Press, that a suspicious man had been seen in the area of the Little General Store, where Linda had been the night of her murder, claiming that this man had been making what they called slurred comments to young girls and women. However, police insisted that they knew nothing of this, and made no comment about these allegations for quite some time. In the weeks to come, investigators would employ several bizarre methods to help track down the killer of Linda Pickeritz, including the usage of hypnosis in an attempt to obtain clues from potential witnesses. As you can imagine, this would fail to come up with anything definitive, as would the administration of polygraph tests to potential suspects. Early on, a lot of attention was cast upon a disappearance that was reported the day after Linda's death, Friday, October 13th, 1978. A 17-year-old named Christine Gudella disappeared from her family's home in Punta Gorda after heading out on a walk that Friday evening and wasn't seen again for several days. Some in the area believed that her disappearance could be related to Linda's murder, 
since the two were young blonde girls that had just moved to the region and went missing within 24 hours. However, the teenager turned up again more than a week later, having run off to spend some time with new friends, and no charges were filed concerning her brief disappearance. After more than a week spent hunting down leads in the horrifying murder of Linda Pickeritz, investigators admitted that they were continuing to probe certain persons of interest. Lieutenant William Clement, the chief investigator for the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office, who was overseeing the case, told reporters with the news press, We are now checking into certain persons who might be suspects and certain types of vehicles possibly involved in the abduction. Investigators would eventually reach out to psychologists in the region and would consult with members of the FBI's burgeoning behavioral science unit, who helped them develop a psychological profile of the killer, who, they believed, was a resident of the region, or was at least someone local to the area. Mental health experts believed that the killer was not a braggart by any means, and was likely skilled at compartmentalizing things, so much so that he likely would not tell anyone about the murder, and was able to repress its memory when it did not suit him. They also believed, based on the circumstances of Linda's murder, that the killer might have been under the influence of drugs at the time, which helped him, or them I guess, further compartmentalize things. Lieutenant William Clement told the news press, In most homicide cases, the suspect usually tells someone, but apparently, that's not the case here. Despite there being no sign of sexual trauma on the victim's body, certain investigators believed there to be sexual overtones to the case. Even if the victim had not been raped, which it was impossible to determine because of the damaged state of her remains, the fire might have acted as some kind of sexual release for the killer, they postulated. Utilizing the psychological profile, investigators stated that they did not believe the killer to be someone that Linda or her family had known previously, as stated by Lieutenant Clement to the press. It's possible but unlikely that he knew her. The family was here for only a short time prior to the murder. It's hard to make that kind of enemy in so little time. The girl had no problems in school or with associates. She was just a likable kid. In November of 1978, Two investigators traveled out of state on a fact-finding mission, but refused to speak to the public about the specifics of their trip, such as where they went or who they had planned on speaking to. Months later though, authorities would admit that there was a suspect who lived in another state that investigators were rather high on, but they had been unable to rouse up enough evidence against him. As recounted by Sheriff Alan LeBeau to the news press, that theory looked real good for a while, but it doesn't anymore. That person is still under consideration, but there are a number of suspects right now. On November 14th, 1978, police announced that they had arrested 20-year-old Philip Lee Drake of Port Charlotte and charged him with perjury. Investigators alleged that Drake had been questioned about the Linda Pickeritz murder and had made a false statement regarding the whereabouts of his vehicle on the day of the murder. During an official police interview, Drake had denied lending his 1972 white Chevrolet to anyone on the evening of Linda's murder, and police claimed that this vehicle matched the description of a vehicle seen in the area near the Lil General store, where Linda had last been seen alive. However, as recounted by Sheriff Alan LeBeau, police learned that Drake did loan the car to some friends at the time of her murder. While police never explained how they had come up with Drake's name during their investigation, he was charged with perjury for lying to investigators, charges that were later dropped in January of 1979. Days after his initial arrest, however, a statewide alert would be issued for another man, 22-year-old Brian Patrick Kane, who was wanted for questioning in connection to the murder. While neither Drake nor Kane were officially named suspects by police, Sheriff Alan LeBeau told reporters that he believed Kane to have important information that could lead us directly to the person or persons responsible for this incomprehensible killing. Brian Patrick Kane turned himself into authorities a few days later and was released after questioning, with no charges filed against him. The 
By December 1978, nearly two months after the murder, investigators would return to the drawing board in an attempt to review the facts of the case, just in case there had been anything they overlooked. They would repeat this process again in 1979, after sources close to the investigation came forward and told reporters that the investigation had been botched early on. Their phrasing, not mine. These sources claimed that investigators had lost focus early on, and then allowed the case to become dormant after a little more than a month. These claims seemed to intensify in May of 1979, when an article in the news press revealed that investigators had traveled to Connecticut to meet with a man named Edward C. Moser. Moser had lived in Port Charlotte until the fall of 1978, when his life had begun to to unravel and his marriage had fallen apart. Moser, a father of five, had then packed up his things and moved away to Ellington, Connecticut, where he was soon admitted and treated at a mental hospital. After moving to Connecticut, Moser had been detained by authorities after he covered himself in a flammable liquid and attempted to set himself on fire. The only reason he had failed was that the lighter he was using at the time had broken during this usage. Inside a car nearby, which police identified as having been driven by Moser, they found a note which was reported by South Windsor Police Captain Bill Ryan to contain the comments of a despondent man. Speaking to the news press, Captain Ryan recalled, It mentions Florida and Connecticut, but not anything specific. A section of the note read, I may be wanted in Florida for something else. I don't know. I may be killed someone on a local street with one of my kid's cars. I don't remember too good, but it's possible. Moser's ex-wife told investigators, as recounted by the news press, that her husband talked a lot about suicide and had a number of automobile accidents. He was having recurring nightmares wherein he hit a kid or a number of kids. Investigators from Charlotte County traveled to Connecticut to meet with Edward Moser and his lawyer, but were unable to sit down and talk with either. Not only were they unable to get this potential suspect and his attorney in a room with them, but everyone they tried to talk to during this trip, Moser's friends and family, his acquaintances, even local officials, rebuffed their offer. Later, officials with Charlotte County claimed that Moser had a decent alibi for the murder, with a security alarm at the store he owned in Port Charlotte having gone off at around the same time that firefighters had discovered Linda's burning body, just before midnight, and he had then met with police at the store. However, to me, this seems anything but definitive, considering the fire was started just a few miles away and had been reported to authorities more than a half hour prior. Nonetheless, this seemed to be enough to erase Edward C. Moser from the suspect pool, and the Charlotte County Sheriff's Department's ineffectiveness highlighted itself in their inability to simply interview him. In June of 1979, authorities released a composite sketch of their prime suspect, a white man between 25 and 30 years old, with a somewhat long face, thin cheekbones, pouty lips, shaggy or wavy brown hair, dark colored eyes, likely brown, and a mustache. This man, who reportedly stood about 6 feet tall and weighed approximately 180 pounds, was believed to have been spotted talking to Linda on the night of the murder, near the intersection of Midway Boulevard and Broad Ranch Drive. This was a location nearby the convenience store she had last been seen in, not too far away from where her bike had been abandoned, and the two were reportedly seen together at about 7 p.m., about 15 minutes before Linda was last seen alive. Investigators noted that this man reportedly drove a white sedan, which could have been either a Ford, Chevy, or Plymouth. When asked why it had taken so long for authorities to release this composite sketch, Lieutenant Jim Jones, who had just been appointed to head the investigation months prior, cited the confusing nature of the case he had inherited. Sadly, this seems to track, with almost everyone involved in the case noting the dysfunctional early days of the case that led to tips not being followed up on, evidence being misplaced or outright lost, and investigators figuratively chasing their own tails. During a round of press interviews, Lieutenant Jones stated that he believed the suspect still lived in the area, and probably had a past history of this type of thing. It's probably his first time, or even his second or third time, assaulting someone. However, based on the brutal nature of this crime, which had not been seen in the region before, Jones believed that this was the first time he had escalated to killing. Soon, 
Authorities would admit that their suspect pool, which had narrowed down from dozens of potential suspects to two or three, had narrowed down yet again to a single suspect. Police believed that in time, the evidence would prove that this individual had been behind the murder of Linda Pickeritz. Yet, in 1980, after turning over their case to prosecutors, it was almost immediately mothballed by state attorneys who believed that it was not solid enough to stand up to a grand jury, let alone a court of law. As recounted by state attorney Joseph D'Alessandro to the news press that year, there's not enough evidence to proceed. They have a good suspect, but basically the bottom line is there isn't enough evidence to prosecute anybody. For the next handful of years, the case would remain in a mostly dormant state. Investigators would come and go, try and recalibrate everything, but basically leave the case where they found it. That is, until Sergeant Ken Barton was brought in by the Charlotte County Sheriff to work exclusively on this case, which was, at the time, the most ominous unsolved case in the county. Newly appointed Sheriff John McDougall, who had been appointed on an interim basis, gave Sergeant Barton the task of reinvestigating the case after meeting with the Pickerets family. Later, when speaking to the news press, Sergeant Barton explained, it wasn't totally inactive, but if there is such a thing as a back burner, this case was as back burner as you can get. Months later, after focusing on this case exclusively, Sergeant Barton announced to the press that he was so confident in the case that he believed an arrest was imminent. The following year, in March of 1986, Sheriff John McDougall held a press conference announcing that he had delivered a 2,000-page investigative report to prosecutors and expected an arrest to be made in a short period of time. Days would pass, and then weeks, but police would finally announce the arrest of a suspect in the murder of Linda Pickeritz, 35-year-old Bradley Phillip Scott from West Palm Beach, who was charged with first-degree murder and arrested without incident. Alan LeBeau, the former sheriff of Charlotte County, told reporters on the day of Scott's arrest, he was our number one suspect all along. I hope now they've got him. Bradley Philip Scott had been born in Nova Scotia, but his family had moved to the U.S. when he was a toddler. Raised in Odessa, Florida, Bradley was no stranger to loss, with his father having died of cancer in his youth. He and his siblings would then be raised by their mother, who had to work long hours to support them. As a result, Bradley and his brother, Mitchell, ended up getting into a lot of trouble as teenagers, and both dropped out of school. Mitchell, Bradley's younger brother would end up going to prison for a litany of crimes, but was sent away for life after being convicted for multiple rape robberies, while Bradley was himself involved in a lot of illegal activity, such as theft and drugs. He reportedly despised his brother for a long time because of his brother's violent nature. Bradley Scott had come upon investigators' radar shortly after the murder of Linda Pickeritz, having been convicted of battery in a case involving another girl from Port Charlotte, which unfolded approximately two months after Linda's murder, just a few days before Christmas 1978. In that incident, Bradley had picked up a 15-year-old girl that had been hitchhiking along U.S. Route 41. The girl had offered him a joint, and the two drove off to a remote, wooded area where they proceeded to drink and smoke before making out. This was about three miles away from where Linda's body had been burned, and while the two made out, per the admission of both, Bradley had attempted to take it a step further. After the girl rebuffed his demands, Bradley reportedly hit her in the head. She claims that he then threatened to kill her, but she was able to fight him off and flee the scene. She eventually sought help, leading to Bradley's arrest that December. Months later, Bradley Scott was found guilty of simple battery and was sentenced to serve a year at the Charlotte County Jail. However, he had been previously arrested for a few crimes, including driving under the influence of alcohol and for solicitation of prostitution, so he was no stranger to the jailhouse. 
Following his release in 1980, he would end up spending the next handful of years in and out of prison for various offenses, ranging from assault to car theft to drug offenses. It was later noted that he had been arrested 36 times in his life, with 25 of those coming between 1980 and 1986. Most, however, were simple misdemeanors that resulted in short stays in jail or a fine. However, it was his year-long stint in jail for assault, after picking up the teenage hitchhiker, that intrigued investigators the most. This offense had happened just two months after Linda's murder, when they were investigating everyone that had a loose connection to sex crimes in the area. And it just so happened that Bradley Scott was a spitting image of the composite sketch that investigators released to the public back in 1979. Over time, investigators' focus had narrowed in almost completely on Bradley Scott, with authorities eliminating the other possible suspects, such as Philip Drake, Brian Kane, and Edward Moser, from their potential pool. However, despite this narrow field of suspects dwindling down to one, authorities never had enough evidence to prosecute Scott, with the case being held up by state prosecutors who believed it would not survive a trial. That is, until Sergeant Ken Barton came onto the case, claiming to have overhauled it with investigative techniques that were not available years prior. This included not only psychological profiling, but cutting-edge forensic testing that allowed Charlotte County to reevaluate and analyze its available evidence, or so they said. In the meantime, Bradley Scott had settled down into a quiet life with his family. At the time of his arrest, he lived with his new wife April and their two children in West Palm Beach. Their youngest child, a son, had been born literally days before Bradley's arrest in May of 1986. During preliminary hearings, meant for the defendant to submit his plea and for the court to determine his bond, the state would begin to present their argument for Bradley Scott's guilt. Their case was centered around what they believed to be airtight forensic evidence, which included a hair found in Scott's 1971 Mercury Monterey which authorities stated matched Linda Pickerett's in all class characteristics. They also alleged to have found hairs on Linda's tennis shoes recovered at the crime scene, which they said matched Bradley Scott. The linchpin of their case, however, was a necklace found at the crime scene, which appeared to have been ripped off of her body. Authorities claimed that a missing bead from this necklace had been found in the vehicle of Bradley Scott which had been searched approximately 10 months after Linda's murder. Authorities stated that this bead had been examined by FBI analysts, who stated that the seashell-shaped bead found in Scott's Mercury Monterey could be the missing bead from the necklace. In addition to this physical evidence, authorities also presented more circumstantial evidence, such as witness reports from those that had known both Bradley Scott and the victim. On the morning after the murder, prosecutors alleged that Scott had asked two separate people about the girl murdered in the woods, which they claim was hours before any details of the case had been provided to the public. Then, they stated that three separate witnesses had seen Scott talking to 12-year-old Linda on the night of the murder having been sitting in his white Mercury Monterey, which they said matched the vague description of the vehicle distributed by law enforcement in 1979. Another witness had reportedly seen Scott talking to Linda ahead of the murder, which fit in with the theory that Linda had known her killer, and other witnesses reported seeing the two speaking together before the day of Linda's death. In addition to this, prosecutors alleged, Bradley Scott had worked as a construction worker and had helped install a sprinkler system at a home in Linda's neighborhood approximately three weeks before her murder. Through this job, he also had easy, untraceable access to gasoline, which may have been used to start the fire that killed Linda Pickeritz. In response to these allegations, Bradley Phillips Scott's defense attorneys, along with critics, argued that the state's case was incredibly circumstantial, relying heavily upon witness statements in a case that was more than seven years old, and now hinged upon iffy physical evidence. 
officials that had worked on the case years prior and knew the intimate details of the early investigation, noted that Bradley Phillips Scott had been a suspect for quite some time. These officials would become some of the biggest critics of this case in the press, noting that the current case against Bradley Scott was essentially the same case that had been constructed back in 1979, only now with things slightly rearranged. If you recall, this was the same case that had been ruled too weak to prosecute by the state attorneys overseeing this district, who now felt comfortable pursuing almost the exact same case years later. Some worried that a failure to properly investigate or prosecute this case could lead to an acquittal, or worse, an end to the case itself which seemed largely half-baked. Leonard Johnson, Bradley Scott's primary attorney, unsuccessfully argued for the charges to be dismissed because of the state's weak case and the amount of time that had already passed, stating, My client is prejudiced by 91 months. The murder took place in 1978, but he wasn't arrested for it until 1986. In that time, evidence has disappeared. Key witnesses have died and memories have faded. He cannot present an adequate defense due to these factors. At the end of these preliminary hearings, the judge refused to dismiss the charges, and bond for Bradley Scott was set at $100,000, but was later revoked. As he had done all along, Bradley Philip Scott pleaded innocent to the charge filed against him. Bradley Scott's trial was scheduled to begin in 1987, but a series of setbacks would cause delays. Namely, a lead investigator on the case, as well as some other integral figures, missing the dates for their depositions, and then printed depositions containing evidence going missing from a county courthouse. In July of 1987, Scott would write a letter to the judge, asking him to proceed with the trial in a timely fashion, with him having been detained in the jail for more than a year at this point, with no end in sight. He contended that prosecutors had spent the entire past decade preparing for this eventuality, but still needed time somehow to file for delays and appeals in order to get their case against him straightened out. Scott claimed that this infringed on his constitutional right to obtain a speedy trial, and may have been used as a tactic by prosecutors to coerce him into a plea deal. This claim would end up falling on deaf ears, however, with the trial then delayed until January of 1988. The judge feared that holding a trial during the holiday season would cause witnesses to miss their scheduled court appearances. Another potential setback came in the form of Bradley Scott's attorney, the Charlotte County Public Defender, resigning his post that fall. This would spark fears of yet another delay, but a private attorney was brought in to oversee the defense moving forward, and a trial start date was finally set for January 5th, 1988, nearly 10 years after Linda Pickeritz had been killed, and nearly two years after Bradley Scott had been arrested. If convicted, he faced the possibility of either life in prison or death via electric chair. The state's case against Bradley Scott largely hinged on the evidence I listed a few minutes ago, which had been presented during preliminary hearings to explain how dire a threat he was to the community. This included the hair fibers found at the crime scene and in Scott's vehicle, as well as a small bead found in his car, found approximately 10 months after the murder, which authorities speculated had come from a necklace belonging to Linda Pick. However, when presenting the hair fibers in court, prosecutors offered up no testimony proving or even indicating that the hair fibers found in Scott's vehicle were definitively Linda's. They only shared that it had the same characteristics. Quote unquote, and offered up no evidence to support the claim that the hair fibers found on Linda's tennis shoes had belonged to Bradley Scott. Witnesses, including friends of Linda's, testified that Bradley used to provide them beer and weed, and often met with or talked to them at the convenience store, where Linda had last been seen alive. This seemed to somewhat shatter the innocent image of Linda, who had been portrayed as a little girl that was riding her bike down to the corner convenience store to pick up a pack of bubble Gum. In fact, testimony presented by the prosecution alleged that she used this excuse to ride down to the convenience store in order to drink beer and smoke weed with her friends in or around this area. While I'm not trying to claim this behavior is either good or bad, I, like Linda, experimented with drugs and alcohol during my teenage years. 
Defense attorneys argued that this did more harm to the prosecution's case than their own. After all, it seemed to open up the possibility that Linda might have been attempting to meet up with other drug dealers in the area while looking for marijuana, which might have led her to get into someone's car and drive to an isolated location nearby. In return, prosecutors argued that this person was none other than Bradley Scott. Other witnesses that testified during the trial put him in the neighborhood of the convenience store on the night of the murder driving a white vehicle that matched the suspect's description. Prosecutors then attempted to lay the groundwork for the next step of their case, proving that Bradley Scott was a burgeoning serial killer who preyed upon young girls in West Palm Beach. But the judge ruled that none of that evidence was relevant to this case. For that reason, it wasn't allowed to be submitted in court. When it came time for defense attorneys to present their side of the argument, they revealed to the jury that Bradley Philip Scott had not been investigators' only suspect, nor their primary suspect, for quite some time. They pointed to the early case files, which had pointed towards several suspects, including Edward C. Moser, the man that had moved to Connecticut and attempted to set himself on fire. However, defense attorneys were unable to present evidence of Moser's suicide note, which had seemed to implicate him in multiple unsolved crimes in Florida and Connecticut, perhaps even Linda's murder, due to the judge ruling it inadmissible for this case. However, the defense was able to point the finger at at least two separate offenders, who had been thoroughly investigated by Charlotte County officials for this case. Philip Lee Drake and Brian Patrick Kane. If you recall, both had been sought by police back in 1979, and Drake had been charged with perjury for lying to investigators, but police had never explained away their potential involvement or why they had been cleared. Virgil Shelton, a witness brought in by the defense, claimed that Brian Kane had confessed to him when the two were in jail together, claiming that Philip Drake and he had been high on PCP on the day of Linda's murder. At some point, she had ended up in the car with them, and they then drove her to the woods, where Kane supposedly confessed to Drake raping and killing her before setting her body on fire. This witness, Virgil Shelton, had actually cooperated with investigators early on, who helped get his charges dropped in exchange for information about the other two. It was also learned during the trial that Philip Drake was one of the main sources of alcohol and marijuana for Linda and her friends. Witnesses testified that Drake had been a primary source of drugs for teens and young adults in the area, giving Linda Pickeritz a reasonable motivation for having sought him out or gone with him to another location. The attempts to throw out other potential suspects weren't so much to point the guilt in their direction, as much as it was to deflect it away from Bradley Scott, the accused. After all, any reasonable level of guilt is meant to deter from a guilty verdict, and highlighting these other potential suspects that police had seemingly not thoroughly vetted nor properly cleared was meant to do just that. Through his attorneys, Scott also provided other evidence that he hoped would clear him of the murder charge. This included an alibi for the evening of the murders, with Bradley Scott claiming that he had been at a shopping mall in Sarasota with his then-girlfriend, more than 50 miles away, purchasing a suede jacket. He was unable to provide definitive proof of this trip because so much time had passed since. He no longer had the receipt for the purchase, and store records did not extend that far back. But he alleged that this alibi had been checked out and vetted by the early investigators, who had cleared him as a result. Defense attorneys would also argue that the forensic evidence offered up by the prosecution was not very credible, since the necklace bead, which they claimed belonged to a shell necklace at the crime scene had been in Scott's vehicle 10 months after the murder. At the time, the vehicle had already been sold and was sitting in a used car lot, so the chain of custody was far from secure. They also believed that the bead could have come from Scott's mother, who had crafted items with similar beads for years. After three weeks of testimony from both sides, the trial came to an end in January of 1988. After deliberating for approximately 12 hours, the jury, which was comprised of six men and six women, came back with a verdict of guilty. A day or so later, the same jury recommended that Bradley Philip Scott receive the death penalty, voting 8-4 in favor of death. According to the news press, 
The jury believed that the murder was sickening, evil, atrocious, or cruel enough under state law to justify what prosecutors called the ultimate penalty. More than a week later, Circuit Judge William McIver, who had overseen the trial, returned with a similar decision, siding with the jury's recommendation. He ruled that Bradley Phillips Scott should die via electric chair, stating, the people, and now the court, have determined that you should not survive your monstrous act. Bradley Scott, who had not taken the stand during his trial, was allowed to make a brief statement to the court during this sentencing hearing. I've only got a couple of things to say, if it's okay with the court. One is I feel real bad for the family. They have been victimized, as my family has and I. I have not committed any crime. They have found me guilty. I didn't do it. After being sentenced to die for the murder of 12-year-old Linda Pickeritz, Bradley Philip Scott would begin to live out the rest of his presumably short life on death row, awaiting the day that he would be taken away to the electric chair, a fate reserved for criminals such as Ted Bundy, who was similarly executed by the state of Florida in 1989. However, through his attorneys, Bradley Scott would file an appeal almost immediately, planning to take the case all the way up to the Florida Supreme Court if he had to. Later, in 1988, months after his conviction, Scott would speak to reporters with the news press, hinting that he would commit suicide if the appeals were rejected, stating, I never killed nobody. The only thing that keeps me alive is my family. I live to prove my innocence and be back with my wife and children. But if the appeal doesn't happen, I'm going to end it for them. They would be better off. It's not good for my wife and my kids to see me like this, in here. I didn't do it. I'm not walking out of here by pleading guilty. I would sooner die. They offered me a plea bargain in 1987. They said I could get out of here in 25 years if I would just plead guilty. I could care less about that. I don't want to be known as the guy who could kill a child. I know I didn't do it, but nobody will believe me. So, I'm waiting to be sentenced to die. Meanwhile, Bradley Scott's wife, April, who had just given birth to their second child two days before his 1986 arrest, had spent the entire duration of his time in jail and prison obtaining her criminal justice degree while raising the kids as a single parent, essentially. She made the six-hour drive to Bradley's prison every month and continued to advocate for his innocence. Her faith was eventually rewarded. In May of 1991, a decision was made to overturn the conviction of 40-year-old Bradley Philip Scott by the Florida Supreme Court, who voted unanimously to overturn the conviction from Charlotte County and acquit Scott of Linda Pickeritz's murder. In their ruling, the Florida Supreme Court found that Scott was no longer able to corroborate his alibi that initially was checked out by law enforcement officials. He was unable to present certain witnesses in his defense because the witnesses had died, and evidence that may have been helpful to Scott was lost as a result of this delay. The seven-member Supreme Court found that the alibi presented by Bradley Scott during his trial, that he had been 50 miles away from the crime scene, buying a suede jacket at a shopping mall with his then-girlfriend, had been deemed valid by early investigators, hence the case against him being judged as incredibly weak by prosecutors in 1980. It wasn't until 1986, when evidence of his alibi had faded, that authorities decided to try his case again. Because so much time had passed, Scott was no longer able to provide proof that he had been at the shopping mall on the night of the murder, and investigators had lost their only records showing that this alibi had been vetted by the original investigators. Not only did this decision to delay the trial, thus allowing this evidence to fade, violate Bradley Scott's civil rights, but it seriously weakened the validity of the case, which was already incredibly weak and circumstantial. 
In their ruling, Florida's Supreme Court also criticized authorities' handling of evidence, claiming that the haphazard way the evidence in this case was mixed up with that from other cases, or had simply been lost to time, was unacceptable for a guilty verdict especially for a guilty verdict that had resulted in the death penalty. The Supreme Court's ruling even made it clear that the witness testimony provided by the prosecution had been bunk, with one of the most convincing witnesses having had a prior relationship with Bradley Scott. This individual had known Scott and had even been to his house with him there but had not identified him to police as the man seen speaking to Linda at the convenience store until 1985, seven years after the murder. In their ruling, the Florida Supreme Court summarized, We find that the circumstantial evidence presented by the prosecution could only create the suspicion that Scott committed the murder. Suspicions cannot be a basis for a criminal conviction. Our law requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt and a fair trial for a defendant. In summary, we find that the unjustified seven-year, seven-month delay in the prosecution of this cause violates the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment and that the state has not been able to show that the circumstantial evidence in this case is not only consistent with the defendant's guilt, but also inconsistent with any reasonable hypothesis of innocence. Accordingly, we have no choice but to reverse Bradley P. Scott's conviction, vacate his death sentence, and remand this cause to the trial court with directions to enter an order of acquittal. It is so ordered. Sheriff John McDougall of Charlotte County would ask the state attorney general to appeal the decision, and Joseph D. Alessandro, the state attorney that had overseen the case, vowed to take it up to the U.S. Supreme Court if he had to. However, neither of these things would happen, and in August of 1991, the decision was made to free Bradley Philip Scott from his sentence. He was allowed to walk out of jail a free man, and as far as I can tell, has remained a free man since this date nearly 30 years ago. In the years after Linda's murder, her family would struggle to find themselves any peace or solace, especially since they had just relocated their lives to southern Florida a few months prior and now had to grieve the loss of their youngest child. Eventually, the family would move away from their home on Ab Henry Circle, and eventually they would move away from Port Charlotte entirely. Speaking to the news press in October of 1981, on the third anniversary of Linda's murder, her mother Betty stated, Somebody out there knows something. I don't know why they won't come forward and give us the information we need. How can they live with themselves every day knowing what took place? It's a mystery to me. There are too many things that don't tie in, a lot of questions, and no answers to them. Sadly, Betty Pickeritz passed away in 2007. Now, not too many people are left to pass on the memory of her daughter, whose life was tragically cut short by an unknown killer. This case was brought to my attention a while back by Jesse Pollock, a friend of mine that you all may recognize as the author of The Acid King and one of my good podcasting friends. For a while, this story just sat in my large folder of bookmarks until I started looking into it. I did not expect to find much considering how old this case is and how it has virtually no web presence. There are no posts on web sleuths or Reddit about Linda, no podcast, no recent news coverage. Hell, the most recent newspaper articles I could find, which only mention the case in passing, came from the 1990s. This story seems all but forgotten to the world, and I think that it falls on us, the people who are interested in true crime and mystery, to keep these stories alive. After all, if not us, then who? While so much time has passed, and while police are unlikely to have worked on this case in several decades, I do think it's still solvable. Every case is. I can only hope that the remaining loved ones of Linda get the justice they so badly deserve, even if it does arrive decades after it should have. Until such a time, the story of Linda Pickeritz will remain unresolved.
thank you for listening to this episode of Unresolved. I have been your host, Michael Whelan. This episode of the show was researched, written, and produced by myself, and the music throughout this episode was put together by yours truly through Amper Music. The song you're hearing right now, however, is the Unresolved theme song, which was written and composed by Ailsa Traves. For a full list of sources and references, please head to the podcast website at unresolved.me to learn more. There, you can also find a transcript for each episode, as well as all of the contact information you'll ever need. Now, I would like to take a minute to thank the producers of this podcast, who support the show each month through Patreon. These wonderful people are Roberta Jansen, Ben Crocom, Gabriella Bromley, Travis Sepko, Brian Hall, Quill Carter, Stephen Wilson, Laura Hannon, Damian Moore, Amy Hampton, Scott Meesey, Joe Wong, Marie Vangland, Scott Patzold, Astrid Nyer, Aime McGregor, Sarah Moscaritolo, Sydney Scotton, Ruth Durbin, Thomas Ahern, Marion Welsh, Patrick Loxo, Meadow Landry, Tatum Bautista, Rebecca O'Sullivan, Denise Grogan, Jared Midwood, Michelle Watson, Ryan Green, Kevin McCracken, Jacinda Class, Stephanie Joyner, Tunya Elzinga, Cherish Brady, Lauren, and Sally Ranford. Words cannot express how grateful I am for all of you, and for all of you listening. Sadly, this is going to be the last episode of Unresolved for a few weeks at least, but at least it's for a good reason. My very pregnant wife is set to pop any day now, so I'm trying to wrap up my ongoing projects before that happens because I know the first few weeks at least will be incredibly hectic. However, I'm going to try and use that time to get a good start on the next season, which will kick off sometime in late June or early July, sometime this summer. I'm also going to try and catch up on some Patreon perks that I've been neglecting lately. I do apologize patrons, I've just had a lot going on. Speaking of, I'm hoping to upload an interesting piece of audio soon, which will fill you in on a side project that I've been working on lately with an aforementioned friend, which may or may not be moving forward in some form based on how y'all react to it. Stay tuned for that, as well as another project that is being produced by Audio Chuck, which I did the research and writing for, so be on the lookout for that. I'm just kind of spiraling now. I'm brain dead because I've written this script and recorded it all in one day, so that's been fun. But I just want to thank you all for sticking through Unresolved in what has been perhaps the most strange and uneven year in human history. It was definitely a tumultuous season for a lot of reasons. Just check the iTunes reviews to figure out why. <laughs> but it's one that I'm incredibly proud of. I cannot wait to come back for the start of season seven, which, holy shit, I never thought I would say that. Anyhow, thanks for listening, everybody. I sincerely love you all, and please take care of yourselves in the weeks to come. I will talk to you later.